Now, let's take a look at the characteristics of professions from the perspective of uh, com computing, okay? From the perspective of computer engineering or software engineering, okay, computing profession. So when we take a look at the mastery of knowledge, uh, we can easily say that most computer experts are adept at a body of knowledge. But, of course, they know something. They're very good at a body of knowledge. But the important question is, is there a core body of knowledge that unifies all computer professionals in the, uh, in the world or in, in, the, in the domain of expertise? Is it possible? That's an important question. So, if we can say that, no, I mean, uh, th there are some differences between the curriculums of software engineering, uh, significant differences between, uh, for example, computer science and computer engineering and information management, whatever, then we cannot talk about a mastery of knowledge at all. If there isn't a core, uh, let's say, there is a consensus on a uh, body of knowledge at all. Like, uh, so, is this... If it is not like this, if there is not a core body of knowledge, then this question can be valid. Is this more like a craft than science? So it's, it's, it's a negative aspect of computer uh, computing at all. There are several accreditation systems like the, the ABIT in the United States. We have a similar version of this uh, MUDEC in Turkey, for example. It's, it's accreditates the departments and say that they uh, satisfy some uh, acceptable standards at all. Uh, this is the, the, the accreditation systems are available. Uh, but not all of them are, are accredited, we can say this. And the, we, we should keep in mind that credentials, which are also called certificates that companies give, don't contribute to the professionalization of computing. So, of course, they are very useful. The certificates from Cisco trainings or, I don't know, Microsoft trainings or something, of, to of course, they are valuable, but they don't contribute to mastery of knowledge at all. It's something different. And another significant problem is the researcher-practitioner distinction is not clear. So they're not exactly divided. I mean, when we look at the, from the, look from the perspective of uh, research and development, for example, uh, inventing new things, not only scientists develop here, there are lots of research going on in uh, private companies' labs as well. Like, uh, can we say that, uh, I mean, Google or Amazon or uh, Microsoft are not inventing anything at all. This is ridiculous, right? So uh, we can easily say that the uh, researcher practitioner is not exactly divided in this sense. So, okay, this is the current uh, situation about the mastery of uh, body of knowledge. Okay, how about the second one, for example? Do we have or do... Uh, Compu computing professionals have a formal organization. Okay, I is there a single unifying organization here? Can we talk about this? No, there is not a single institution here. Of course, there are some varieties. Not long ago, computer professionals and computing professionals in Turkey were uh, a sub uh, section of electrical and electronical engineers uh, department. Uh, branch of uh, in the a branch in the electro electronical and uh, uh, emo uh, we we said it uh, electric man's little but uh, I mean we we now have compu computing professionals have its uh, their own bigserman's uh, their own uh, institution now but is it a must to be a member of this no I mean. Uh, uh, since we have no, you, you, the, hey, since there is no universally accepted formal admission process here, accredited degree in compu co uh, computer engineering or computer science or a particular certification may have an advantage for certain positions. That's all you can get. But uh, 
if there were a unified organization, then other, uh, let's say, people would not be able to do the job. You will have the right to sign the projects, for example, but in this case, no. But of course, it will give you some advantage to have a degree in uh, computer science or computer engineering, for example. And how about the third one, the autonomy? The, the, there is no regulation about who can do what in computing, okay? The, so we can talk about varying degrees of autonomy for individuals here, depending on what area or what part of the company you're working. Uh, maybe you've seen this in your training uh, uh, sessions in summer uh, trainings or something, summer practices, maybe you witnessed this as well. Here, uh, ABIT is again the most collective power here, like uh, uh, because the computing professionals have some control over computer code, which is an important form of autonomy. No one, I mean, uh, you have the full control there. So uh, there is a significant power on behalf of others who cannot understand or read that code. That's the, that that gives the computing professionals. A significant degree of autonomy here but, but, but be careful something like this also correlates to responsibility like in spider-man okay the power uh, with the power comes the responsibility as well it's uh, okay it is also written in our textbooks as well and what about the fourth one code of ethics there is no single code of ethics uh, for example there is a version of a cm association of computing Mach machinery professionals like they they have a list which is valid for today it it has it has gone under several revisions i think the i may be mistaken i'm i'm sorry but uh, maybe in 2003 or something you can check for the nevis version as far as i know the process of developing and adopting a code of ethics is complex and often highly politicized, especially in the computing <coughs> domain. And what about, because you're not bound with only a single code of ethics here. Okay, what, is the, what about the last one about the culture of computing? There are again variety depending on what uh, sector you're working in or what is your uh, job definition is so it is difficult to generalize its culture it's uh, you, you you cannot make a strip comic easily about computer professionals not, not, not easy like this so is for example is this culture male when you make a stereotype stereotypes of engineers are all usually seen as males who block their social environment um, like uh, they are buried with your with their computers or devices or something and they prefer technical challenges to social interactions. Is that so? I, to a degree. But with internet, uh, being glued to computer is no more a non-social activity as well. I mean, we're trying to get rid of uh, from those devices to socialize, in fact. Uh, like, uh, anyway. So, uh, when we try to sort out computing and its status as a profession, as a bottom line, we have a significant level of mastery of esoteric body of knowledge. We can talk about this. And there are several codes of ethics as well. That's uh, important. But we can conclude that it is absolutely not a strongly differentiated profession, which is pretty clear from the understanding that you have no special powers or privileges in a company. I mean, uh, yes, th there can be licenses for this, but not yet. I mean, for computing uh, profession. Of course, it's a more it's more like a profession than car sellers, waitresses, bank clerks. Okay, it's more than this, but it is absolutely less than medicine, law, accounting, or something because uh, they have they significantly have some special powers or privileges at all. Software engineers are the pioneers. If, if one day in close future there will be some licenses to sign a pro, uh, software project or something, software engineering discipline is the pioneers, which is a subgroup of computing we can call. And 
when we talk about software engineering, what, what they do is they work on the quality and safety of software being sold uh, by they control the quality of it. Um, the state of Texas licensing software en engineers since 1998, uh, but, but, but no states followed after this. And they set a minimum requirements and an exam to pass to license those software engineering. And they also uh, pushed their members or made their members responsible for ACM's code of ethics also. I mean, they need to admit that they're bound with the ACM's code of ethics. But when we look at other states or in different countries, in Canada, for example, even engineering definition of computing is controversial. There are several lawsuits against software engineering, and some uh, approved by some en engineering organizations, of course. So, as you can see, the uh, perspectives can be different. Here you see the uh, uh, software engineering exam of uh, NCEES uh, in Texas, for example, but, uh, but, but the thing is, uh, they will discontinue the, uh, those exams as of April 2019. So it's no more. I mean, uh, yes, they were doing this for um, uh, uh, roughly 20 years or something, but they're doing it no more, not, not anymore, it's unfortunately. And why software engineering is pi like uh, uh, slightly have advantage for uh, being a profession in close future, uh, maybe... Uh, they can be because it grew out of a growing awareness about a software crisis, especially in 70s and larger programs resulted in exponential increase in failures and bugs as well. And some of them were even impossible to fix. So that's why the people thought, just remember our, uh, let's say, disasters or failures in uh, uh, 70s and 80s about uh, the, I mean, space projects or something like this. Uh, the software was a significant problem since then. And software engineering discipline focuses on, of course, you know this from the f software engineering course, but just in a way, the specification, requirement analysis, development of software, abstraction, matching specifications, whatever. You already know this. Okay, I'm just uh, passing them quickly. And validation, okay, testing uh, of the software. It's uh, unfortunately, it's dramatically mostly given to fresh personnel. In fact, it's very important because software is much harder to test than testing other engineering artifacts because it's not like a bridge. So testing is done usually in stages and it requires a lot of experience at all. And of course, the last last thing they focus is the evolution, evolution of software to meet the challenging needs, changing needs of, uh, of course, the challenging and changing needs of users as well. It, but is this helping? Are these techniques are useful at all? Yes. Software quality is really improving due to appropriate use of software engineering techniques. As you see here, as of 1994, you see time cost overruns. Okay, it's always the case for uh, software projects, right? Can I mean, uh, we give you a project and you make a delay. It's okay, pretty common. It didn't change much, but uh, we have more on time on budget software here as of 2006 after the application of... Uh, Mm, I mean, uh, proper uh, software engineering techniques uh, mm, resulting in a reduction in cancelled projects which, which, uh, which are uh, killed by the silver bullet, okay? Uh, I, I think I took this figure from uh, the Michael J. Quinn's book, I guess. And uh, what did... If it, it is going to be uh, certified or if, if it is going to be a profession, what kind of uh, uh, exam would that be for licensing? For example, it is a look, look at this, an ATAR open book exam where you have to answer all questions coming from, you see, a set of, uh, I mean, uh, lots of, uh, I mean, all the area you worked uh, so far will be uh, covered here, you see. 
the number of questions here in every particular domain. You can pause the video or look from your PDF uh, slides to see the topics. So it's a very comprehensive, we talk about a very comprehensive exam.